This episode of Ticket Volume is brought to you by us, Invigate. Get service operations under control in no time. Get one free month of our software solution by going to try.invigate.com. Ticket Volume brings you the CEO and managing partner of Boss Lady Consulting and Clarity PX. She's been the director of marketing for Pebble Labs, Multicare Health, and Kaiser Permanente, as well as an extensive tenure in healthcare, serving multiple roles at Centene and Shriners Hospital for Children, Spokane. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and I chat with different leaders each week to share insights on service management, technology, business, this episode is no exception. And hey, while you're here, is there something you're looking to learn about? Leave a comment, connect with us, or share a podcast with someone. For now, though, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Sally Meldrin. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. My pleasure. You and I actually had the opportunity to meet through CX Accelerator via Mr. Nate Brown um, and his lovely board over on the CX Accelerator side. And we wrote a piece uh, yeah. kind of about getting experience management in your organization, convincing leaders and finding situations where maybe it's not being invested well enough. Um, right. So appreciated writing that with you and thanks yeah. for being here let's get started right away though because i want to know a little bit about boss lady consulting because that name is very intriguing how did it get started where is that coming from <laughs> so when i was at centene i was a vice president over a team of about a hundred and that nickname boss lady came from that role my team would come around the corner i was vp but had an open door policy they'd come around the corner and say Hey, boss lady, do you have a minute? And so that's where the name came from. It's a term of endearment for me. And it really reminds me every time I hear it about the human-centered leadership that I tried to express and operate in as a leader in corporate settings that now is really the foundation of what we do as an agency where we're trying to help businesses design their service practices, design their SOPs and their operational processes in a way that keeps their humans in the middle, their staff and their customer. So, Awesome. Yeah. yeah. SOP. Every time there's an acronym, I got to say it out loud, standard operating procedure. Yes. <laughs> so be careful dropping those. I'm going to have to keep up with you. <laughs> yeah, um, and let's talk. It. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about Clarity PX too, because it's like it's there's two arms of the same company, right? Right, right. Boss Lady Consulting is the umbrella brand, and we serve all kinds of service industries outside of healthcare. Clarity PX is specifically targeted at healthcare leaders and organizations and really helping them understand the essential elements to incorporate patient experience into their whole system as well. So we do the, a lot of the same work, marketing and brand and messaging and experience design, but one's healthcare, one's service. Okay, okay. This is such an interesting topic for me. I, I've, I think that a lot of what you've done in your past and what I've done in my past is starting to kind of meld together with yes. under this experience umbrella. The uh -huh. taking bits of what we know from marketing, from psychology, from what inspires action and takes people, um, uh -huh. you know, from point A to point B, and right. then taking that and, and applying it to your, your operational experience, my IT support experience, and sort of bringing that stuff down to meet, um, to meet. So is that kind of how you see experience? What gets you jazzed about experience management? I think the thing that just lights me up is that experience is beginning to really take form. And I think COVID kind of amplified this need as people went remote, distributed workforces, that experience cannot only be about the customer. It's got to also be about the internal agents and staff and leadership. And I think the imperative that is bubbling up in all the research and across all industries is that leaders need to lead in a way that honors the humanity of their own team, 
that that leads them with compassion and with empathy and with great communication. And then the outflow of that is superb customer experience. And so that is exciting to me that it's now beginning to almost amalgamate where people can't fix in a silo for the customer only. They have to take care of their team. Yeah, exactly. We yeah. can't operate in silos. We can't ignore the people that are delivering the service and delivering right. the products and supporting right. it all. Um, and, and this is key, I think. And, and this kind of came out in our article a little bit about how, you know, it experience, it, <clears throat> it's not necessarily all revenue um, uh, touching, all revenue facing necessarily, but you can see indirectly how it's going to impact that. And a lot of people, I think, when they're taking when they're taking the first steps in experience management and trying to figure out what they're going to get out of it, okay. a lot of times they, they really do just focus on the revenue and focus on the customer experience where you yeah. and I both know that it, it's, it's much larger than that. By improving right. the customer experience, you can therefore, you know, also take that opportunity to improve the systems and improve the processes yeah. and improve right. the people delivering it. Um, where do you see people typically like stumbling on this, especially early on in the journey? I think part of the problem is they think they have to wait until they have hundreds of thousands of dollars and can transform the entire organization or install an entire new tech stack or whatever. They, they wait either thinking it's one fix, all new signage or all new IT stack or whatever, rather than identifying the moments that need to improve. And I have found in my career and with working with, with clients that often it's those smaller service design corrections that sometimes don't cost much at all are very practical that make the biggest shift in both engagement for the employees and for the customer. And so to me, that's the biggest, you know, false belief that people have about experience is you have to hire McKinsey and you've got to have millions of dollars. And yet sometimes it's just a nuance of changing the script for your call center or changing how they are rated on a QA score to put the cute consumer first, which makes them feel better. So it's, you know, those kinds of things really are the big thing that stop people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. we, we There's all these business terms that we kind of roll our eyes when we say them, but I really feel like low-hanging fruit is one that really makes a lot of sense. You, yeah. you um, we, we saw it on CX Accelerator this morning on this Slack channel. They, they were asking... You know, am, are my surveys enough? Um, are are my asking the right questions? And really, not necessarily needed. You may not even need a survey. You might talk to four or five new hires and determine that you've got a huge gap or a huge what? opportunity that is going to be something that's non-digital, needs to be fixed, not, um, you know, wouldn't take a, a huge investment. And you don't need Qualtrics or, or Medalia to tell you that you need these things. Um, right. The people are telling you that you need these things. That right. you know, it's like a bootstrapping your experience, kind of, right? Well, and and you bring up a good point in that a lot of times experience decision making and initiatives and proposals are created in the echo chamber of one level of the organization, and when you are engaging your call center staff or your frontline individuals and getting their perspective on it, you're doing two things. You're solving what you think the customer wants rather than getting what your agents are hearing all day, every day, both. or seeing on your social media channels or hearing when they're out in the community, whatever. There's so many things, even, even a lot of organizations are taking the, the call recordings and are you know, really mining those for insights to find out what are the exact words or triggers or emotional drivers that the customers are saying in that body of data 
that doesn't require a survey at all, but it is a gold mine of information in a call center for any type of organization. And I think that ability and the willingness to get the feedback of your frontline staff makes your initiatives way better, way better. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. They're hanging on to a ton of user research that they really yeah. are representing the voice of your customer in a lot of yeah. cases. Yeah. And so what about the outcomes for agents? Like what do we see as um what are we trying to avoid by building better experience by by making their jobs easier? You know, I'll give you an example. When I was at Centene, I had a call center of about a hundred. And the employee engagement was really low. I mean, under 50%. That's bad. (laughs) And the turnover was terrible. And when we really dove into employee experience to find out what did they need, they wanted to be able to do their job and help the customer. But the way the system was set up required that they just hand it off put another note in another person's queue to fix the problem. Well, the and the queues were across five or six divisions. Yeah. And so some queues had 2,000 entries in them, and they, they were going one at a time. Okay, Sally complained about this, so they fixed Sally. But what they weren't doing was identifying in the queue, there are 600 issues that are the same thing. In our case at a health insurance company, it was a flu shot was denying. Well, you know how big they push getting your flu shot. So to have the claim not go through for a flu shot, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Well, rather than segmenting and looking at the big picture, they were doing one line at a time. And rather, we could have cleared their queue out by fixing three things. So the thing for us with the employees was they... They were frustrated at their voicelessness in the organization, which we corrected by getting their feedback, by implementing processes that said, what are you hearing? <laughs> no, what are, and we had, you know, started standout huddles and all the things, the Kanban boards, all the things to be able to ensure that they could provide the feedback of the customer. But then they also were just felt helpless. And that's honestly one of the, there are kind of three drivers of burnout of people. It happens in healthcare, it happens in IT, it happens in a lot of industries. And one of them is emotional exhaustion, (laughs) obviously. But one of them is also lack of personal accomplishment. And so when you as an agent, whether you're on a, a SaaS product call center or you are a medical technologist in a hospital, when your hands are so tied that you can't have impact, that is super stressful. And it erodes engagement faster than almost anything. And then the third thing is just kind of this depersonalization. When you feel like you're a cog Uh in a wheel, you're a faceless, nameless, machine it nobody wants nobody wants that and and the generation of workers that are rising up and replacing all the boomers that have had a harder faster more widgets mindset primarily want to feel like they're making a difference i want to feel like i'm making a difference and so it's it's important in leadership and in your service design that you're finding ways make people feel seen and heard, personalize that experience. Yeah, I love it. I love that you said service design a couple of times in this episode now too, because I think like, I don't know, in IT, we talk about service design a lot because uh-huh. it's basically all that we do is it starts with yeah. service design. Oh, we need to communicate. Okay. <laughs> What's that going to look like? Uh, we need, we need email. Okay. Let's design the service and actually like go sure. through the steps. Sure. And uh, so often, we're not involving the people that are actually doing the work in that. Um, and a lot of companies that are investing in employee experience, they already have a bunch of services set up. So yeah. it's sort of like, um, 
it's it seems like it's an insurmountable task it's we now have to go back to the drawing board and involve okay. these people and and make these changes um do you have any advice for people that are kind of like looking at that mountain of work how should they split it apart well i think there's two directions for that question one is if you already have it set up then invite your team to be reviewing it and optimizing it mm -hmm. you don't have to start from scratch you know and, and like i said earlier a lot of solutions are created in an echo chamber of mm -hmm. the you know hippo the highest paid person in the room or whatever yeah. that term is um you know or the the coo with a thumb in his back to drive revenue revenue and I'll say, as an aside, that McKinsey, Forrester, all of the huge research entities and organizations have demonstrated time and time and time again that the organizations that get CX and employee engagement right are the most profitable in every industry, globally and internationally. So the temptation is to only focus on short-term money grab revenue generating things and to do that in absence of the long-term experience strategy and especially post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, whoa, we need money. Recession, yeah. we need money. And so they get myopic and focus on the short-term thing and then abandon the long-term draw. And you have to do both and in order to truly have sustainable success. But the, I feel like for those who are starting out, don't try to boil the ocean. Find, if, if there's one process that seems to have the most hitches in it, or you're finding this trending complaint, fix that one process. Don't call in McKinsey and spend your millions it may be that you just need a little work group or you need to do a deeper dive into the data and analyze what people what people really need. Ask a few customers. Do a Facebook survey. You know, whatever you need to do, fix one thing. In our agency, we say, make the next moment better. Um, and there's a quote by Maya Angelou that says, you know, we do what we know and then when we know better, let's do better. We don't have to be ashamed of all the past or not having it exactly right. But once we know better, now as a human-centric organization, we have an obligation to do better, whether that's for our staff or for our customer. So I love it. Yes. Yes. Pick <laughs> the <laughs> pick pick the next hill don't don't try to climb the mountain just make it up to that next rock or the next yeah. boulder or the next exactly. turn in the road yeah um and i really like that you you say the make the next moment better you know even if you're if you're solving if you've got a queue of 2000 um claims that aren't going through insurance you know uh -huh. it really is like okay i did a claim great now make the next one better right and the next right. one better ah. right it's so simple to say and really difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, so you have run a, a call center and you have implemented customer experience, implemented customers, focused on customer experience. What do you, like, what are some of the trends that you see um, uh, people getting out of it? Um, what are some of the advantages of service teams that are have fully realized customer experience? So four or five years down the line, what are some of the outcomes that people can expect uh, fr from an initiative like that? Well, the, it's multiple layers. What Obviously, you're going to improve employee engagement because uh -huh. when, when you have integrated that, and in a call center especially, that reduced in our call center when we improved the CX, that reduced our churn in the call center by like 40%. Uh, People stayed. We listened. We created systems and structures, and we changed the organizational chart. We gave them opportunity for promotion. We added layers of support and help to the agent 
but it also gave the frontline call person like a goal. I want to be a supervisor or a manager. I want to be over quality assurance. I want, I want to work on this team. And so it gave them a vision. And so engagement on that case, we, our employee engagement grew 36% in two years. Unbelievable. And the lack of churn in the call center saved us a ton of money. Yeah. It's expensive to get people up to, up to speed. The other thing is that it obviously, as a byproduct, include improved customer satisfaction and retention. Our retention rate year over year for our um, insurance folks went from 42% to 80% in two years. Wow. And those customers are worth millions of dollars to a health uh-huh. company when you're talking 40%. And so we improved loyalty, we improved retention, our work was much more effective, and our at the same time we improved CX and employee engagement because I was also over marketing, we really honed in our external messaging and we made sure that we were hearing what does the provider need, what does the member need, and we grew. We exceeded all of our membership goals because we were right on and internally and externally it all was the same our brand promise became the foundation of our internal culture and it became the recognition system to people so that what we were promising the customer was what we were living internally and that connectivity made a huge difference we improved member and provider satisfaction by more than 30 percent in two years as well and so we went from one of the lowest rated plans to up in the top 10 out of 47, which was amazing in two years time. So more money, more retention, more loyalty, better engagement with employees, and overall, just a better culture. So that's there's a lot to be gained by that experience. Yeah. And which, thanks for that peek into the insurance company or to the insurance industry. What a, right? what a fascinating way to look at things. You know, you're right. selling products, but it, it really is providing a service and right. you know, you've got multiple lines that you, I don't, I don't think about that necessarily about how there's multiple insurance plans and River. what a mess. So what are some no, of the. No one understands it. Right. I think the research said that nearly 80 something percent of us adults don't understand their health insurance yeah so you you get a lot of yelling at (laughs) (laughs) at the call center oh my gosh yeah (laughs) i'm sorry about that i'm sorry for on behalf of all the americans who don't understand their health insurance i am one of them yeah you know, you get some of the concepts, but you don't get all of them all the time. Right. And so, it, like, it's confusing and it's, yeah. and it's a very complex thing. It's not too dissimilar from trying to help a non technical person uh, understand an IT solution. They get so frustrated uh-huh. and it's just, it's difficult. And so, you know, for us, the key was, and one of the books that I love, love, love in healthcare is Compassionomics. It talks the whole thing is a study of research by doctors about doctors and why the burnout. And one of the things that was really highlighted in this book, and they did scientific research with patients where even people at end of life, palliative care, end of life planning who had, you know, severe disease, those they did a all, same exact treatment, but this group was coached on being more compassionate with the patient, specific things to say, whatever. At the end of those studies, the patients that had the compassion treatment added on had 47% less pain, physical pain, than those who didn't. Wow. And it, what's interesting to me, and the book, you know, goes around all this research about how the key, the key component on what's burning healthcare providers out is they get to a place where they feel like they don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is the number one flag and the number one trigger for burnout. 
the thing that was helping them get back into their role passionately was not time off. It was getting them reconnected with their heart and the reason why they're in there, being able to act, again, that kind of personal impact. I'm not just a cog writing a script or doing whatever. I can act on the things I'm hearing from this client. And I think that that body of research applies to every service industry. You know, your your IT call centers that oh, yeah. they want to innovate and they are so excited about technology transformation and about helping people and whatever. And when they get put into that, you know, spot where they are just reading through the script and check this, check that, I'm really sorry to hear your frustration, Mrs. Mildred. <laughs> You know, it's like when they just fall into this rote robotics place and they've lost the heart, that is that is the number one thing that is causing burnout among folks. And I think in the service industries especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, the, the people who are resetting passwords and they do a thousand of them in a row and they ask their manager, hey, can we automate this? Can we add a password reset tool? And the manager says no. And the person is just crushed because they know they know the impact on themselves yep. and on the thousand people whose passwords, you know, now they have to sit on a queue. Now they have to wait for a ticket. Yeah. And the, the impact is real. Yeah. We see it every day in the enterprise how that sort of impact can have real revenue uh, impacts. You know, don't reset a password. Someone can't do a presentation. You lose the million dollar deal. It just okay. happens. It's just how it happens. Right. And um, beyond that, there's an emotional impact on your employee There's enough. because their ability to help their customer timely is what is is an act of compassion yeah and that is what fuels their passion so it's it's not just a simple yes no operational decision and that is my passion is to help leaders understand yeah, I was on the phone the other day with a call center rep from uh, my liability insurance for my agency. Needed to renew, and the broker and the actual insurance agent, one would tell me that you have to pay them. This guy would say, you have to pay them. And I'm like, dude, I just want to pay my bill, and your systems are broken. And so I got on the phone with another call agent, and he... Um, he said, okay, I will help you, you know, just totally monotone. And I said, how's your day? And he, there was like this dead silence. And he, he goes, are you talking to me? <sighs> and, and I said, yeah, how's your day, Ben? And he's like, I can't believe you just asked me that. And he, I mean, literally stunned into silence for five or six seconds, which I'm sure on the quality test, oh gosh, you too much white. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and so he went on, solved my issue, took care of it. And at the end of the call, he said, I can't believe you asked me how my day was. I can't tell you how much that made my whole day. And it was, it was sweet, but it also kind of ticked me off because yeah. I feel like, where the heck is this guy's manager? And where is anybody showing up for this employee to care about him? Yeah. Hey, how's your wife or your kid or your dog? How was your weekend? I mean, it was obvious this guy was a cog in a wheel that had zero human compassion expressed toward him. And, and I feel like I saw you posted that at your work, you guys would go around and greet everybody. Yeah. There's a lot of businesses that would say that is a total waste of time. Get to work. Oh, gosh, here comes the boss. Scurry to your cubby or whatever. Yeah. And honestly, that is a brilliant act of compassion for your people who are in a dark room with the lights down with the black screen. I mean, I've been in some IT places that would make me wilt because <laughs> I'm a flower. I need the sunlight. Yeah. They have kept us in the basement for far yeah. too long. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So, but I just feel like it's, you know, the leadership has to recognize it can't be only about outside. 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. Dude, <laughs> Sally, your okay. wisdom is deep. You are so helpful. I love the way that you always bring it back to the human element of things. Where can people connect with you and learn more? We are on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's at Boss Lady Consult on all of them. So, or our website, bossladyconsult.com. We'd love to chat. You can tell I geek out about this stuff, but it's why I love the IT geek friends as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got to stick together. Thanks for joining us on Ticket Volume, yeah. Sally. Thank you. And for our audience, thanks for listening to this episode. We've got a lot more out there and a bunch more coming, so make sure to subscribe to receive an alert every time there's a new episode. You can also submit a specific topic or guest by DMing me or shouting into the void, maybe I'll hear you, or comment on our LinkedIn page. Speaking well, of that, if you did like today's podcast and want to share feedback or let us know, send us. Send us your reviews, send us your feedback, or post them on your platform of choice. You know that the algorithms will reward us for your interactions. This podcast is brought to you by Invigate, the all-in-one IT service and asset management system that helps organizations with world-class IT support teams. If you're looking for a solution to build your help desk without the headaches of year-long implementations and high total cost of ownership, you're going to love Invigate. In fact, IT teams from NASA, Toyota, McDonald's, and many more use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so that you can focus on delivering better service. Because good service is good business.